Hey y'all, good to see you again. Sorry for the delay in reading The Wrinkle in Time, but I wanted to resume our story time together today by reading chapter five of Wrinkle in Time. Uh, you'll remember in our first few chapters, we met three different women. We met Mrs. Who, Mrs. What's It, and Mrs. Wick. And then in chapter four, it was called The Black You'll remember that Meg and Calvin are uh, with uh, Mrs. Witt when suddenly they see this horrible black thing appear in the distance. And the chapter ends by Meg asking whether that dark thing is what my father is fighting. And Mrs. What's it says, excuse me, Mrs. Witch says, that it is, that the black thing, the dark thing, is what Meg's father is fighting. We still don't know where Meg's father is, but we know that he is fighting this black thing. Okay? So chapter 5, the Tesseract. That dark thing we saw, Meg said, is that what my father is fighting? Yes, Mrs. Witch said. He is behind the darkness so that even we cannot see him. Meg began to cry and sob aloud. Through her tears, she could see Charles Wallace standing there, very small and very white. Calvin put his arms around her, but she shuddered and broke away, sobbing wildly. Then she was enfolded in the great wings of Mrs. Watson, and she felt comfort and strength pouring through her. Mrs. Watson was not speaking aloud, and yet through the wings, Meg understood words. My child, do not despair. Do you think we would have brought you here if there were no hope? We are asking you to do a difficult thing. We are confident that you can do it. Your father needs help. He needs courage. And for his children, he may be able to do what he cannot do for himself. Now, Mrs. Witch said, are we ready? Where are we going, Calvin asked. Again, Meg felt an actual physical tingling of fear as Mrs. Witch spoke. We must go behind the shadows. But we will not do it all at once, Mrs. Wetzik comforted them. We'll do it in short stages. She looked at Meg. Now we will test her. We will wrinkle again. Do you understand? No, Meg said flatly. Mrs. What's his side? Explanations are not easy when they are about things for which your civilization still has no words. Calvin talked about traveling at the speed of light. You understand that, right, little Meg? Yes, Meg nodded. That, of course, is the impractical and long way around. We have learned to take shortcuts wherever possible. Sort of like in math, Meg asked. Like in math, Mrs. What's it looked over at Mrs. Who. Take your skirt and show them. La experiencia es la madre de la ciencia. Spanish, my dears, Cervantes. Experience is the mother of knowledge. Mrs. Hu took a por portion of her white robe in her hands and held it tight. You see, Mrs. Watson said, if a very small insect were to move from the section of skirt in Mrs. Hu's right hand to that in her left, it would be quite a long walk for him if he had to walk straight across. And look at the picture there. See, do you see the insect walking across the string? Swiftly, Mrs. Hu brought her hands, still holding the skirt, together. Now, you see, Mrs. Watson said, he would be there without that long trip. That is how we travel. So do you see the second picture now? That is how Mrs. Hu and Mrs. Watson and Mrs. Witch travel, right? They find a way to shorten the amount of time. It's like pulling a string together so the insect doesn't have to walk as far across. Charles Wallace accepted the explanation serenely. Even Calvin did not seem perturbed. Oh, 
skier makes side. I guess I'm a moron. I just don't get it. That is because you think of space only in three dimensions, Mrs. Lethbridge told her. We travel in the fifth dimension. This is something you can understand, Meg. Don't be afraid to try. Was your mother able to explain the tesseract to you? Well, she never did, Meg said. She got so upset about it. Why, Mrs. What's it? She said it had something to do with her and father. It was a concept they were playing with, Mrs. What's it said. Going beyond the fourth dimension to the fifth. Did your mother explain it to you, Charles? Well, yes. Charles looked a little embarrassed. Please don't be hurt, Meg. I just kept it at her while you were at school till I got it out of her. Meg sighed. Just explain it to me. Okay, Charles said. What is the fifth dimension? Well, a line. Okay, and the second dimension? Well, you'd square the line. A flat square would be in the second dimension. So there's the second dimension. It's a flat square. The first dimension is just a line. The second dimension is a flat square. And the third? Well, you'd square the second dimension. Then the square wouldn't be flat anymore. It would have a bottom and sides and a top. So there's the third dimension. And the fourth? Well, I guess if you want to put it into mathematical terms, you'd square the square. But you can't take a pencil and draw it the way you can the first three. I know it's got something to do with Einstein and time. I guess maybe you could call the fourth dimension time. That's right, Charles said. Good girl. Okay, then. For the fifth dimension, you'd square the fourth, wouldn't you? I guess so. Well, the fifth dimension is a tesseract. You add that to the other four dimensions, and you can travel through space without having to go the long way around. In other words, to put it into Euclid, or old-fashioned plane geometry, a straight line is not the shortest distance between two points. For a brief, illuminating second, Meg's face had the listening, probing expression that was so often seen on Charles's. I see, she cried. I got it. For just a moment, I got it. I can't possibly explain it now, but there was a second I saw it. She turned excitedly to Calvin. Did you get it? He nodded. And now, I don't understand the way Charles Wallace said, but enough to get the idea. So now we go, Mrs. Witch said. There is not all the time in the world. Can we hold hands, Meg asked. Calvin took her hand and held it tightly in his. You can try, Mrs. Witch said, but I'm not sure how it will work. You see, though we travel together, we travel alone. We will go first and take you afterward in the back walk. That may be easier. As she spoke, the great white body began to waver and the wings to dissolve in the mist. Mrs. Hu seemed to evaporate until there was nothing but the glasses, and then the glasses too disappeared. It reminded Meg of the Cheshire cat. I've often seen a face without glasses, she thought, but glasses without a face? I wonder if I go that way too, first me and then my glasses. She looked over at Mrs. Witch. Mrs. Witch was there, and then she wasn't. There was a gust of wind, and a great thrust, and a sharp shattering as she was shoved through. What? Then darkness, silence, nothing. If Calvin was still holding her hand, she couldn't feel it. But this time, she was prepared for the sudden and complete dissolution of her body. When she felt the tingling coming back to her fingertips, she knew that this journey was almost over, and she could feel again the pressure of Calvin's hand about hers. Without warning, coming as a complete and unexpected shock, she felt a pressure she had never imagined, as though she were being completely flattened out by an enormous steamroller. This was far worse than the nothingness had been. While she was nothing, there was no need to breathe, but now her lungs were squeezed together so that although she was dying for want of air, there was no way for her lungs to expand and contract to take in the air that she must have to stay alive. This was completely different from the thinning of atmosphere when they flew up the mountain and she had had to put the flowers to her face to breathe. She tried to gasp, but 
a paper doll can't gag. She thought she was trying to think, but her flattened out mind was as unable to function as her lungs. Her thoughts were squashed along with the rest of her. Her heart tried to beat. It gave a knife-like sidewise movement, but it could not expand. But then she seemed to hear a voice, or if not a voice, at least words. Words flattened out like printed words on paper. Oh no, we can't stop here. This is a two-dimensional planet, and the children can't manage here. She was whizzed into nothingness again, and nothingness was wonderful. She did not mind that she couldn't feel Calvin's hand, that she couldn't see or feel or be. The relief from the intolerable pressure was all she needed. Then the tingling began to came, come back to her fingers and her toes. She could feel Calvin holding her tightly. Her heart beat regularly. Blood coursed through her veins. Whatever had happened, whatever mistake had been made, it was over now. She thought she heard Charles Wallace saying, his words round and full of spoken words all to be, Really, Mrs. Witch, you might have killed us. This time she was pushed out of the frightening fifth dimension with a sudden and immediate jerk. There she was, herself again, standing with Calvin beside her, holding on to her hand for dear life, and Charles Wallace in front of her looking indignant. Mrs. Watson, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Witch were not visible, but she knew they were there. The fact that their presence was strong about her. Children, I apologize, came Mrs. Witch's voice. Now, Charles, calm down, Mrs. Wetchett said, appearing not as the great and beautiful beast she had been when they last saw her, but in her familiar wild garb of shawls and scarves and the old tramp's coat and hat. You know how difficult it is for her to materialize. If you're not substantial yourself, it's very difficult to realize how limiting protoplasm is. I'm sorry, Mrs. Wish's voice came again but there was more than a hint of amusement in it. It is not funny, Charles Wallace gave a childish stamp with his foot. Mrs. Who's glasses shone out and the rest of her appeared more slowly behind them. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, she smiled broadly. Prospero in the temple. I do like that play. He didn't do it on purpose, Charles Wallace. Oh, my darling, of course not, Mrs. Watson said quickly. It was just a very understandable mistake. It's very difficult for Mrs. Wiss to think in a corporeal way. She wouldn't hurt you deliberately. You know that. And it's really a very pleasant little planet, and rather amusing to be black. We always enjoy our visits there. Where are we now, then, Charles Wallace demanded, and why? In a lion's belt. We have a friend here. We want you to have a look at your own planet. When are we going home, Meg asked anxiously. What about Mother and the twins? They'll be terribly worried about us. When we didn't come in at bedtime, well, Mother must be frantic by now. She and the twins in Fort will have been looking and looking for us, and of course we're not there to be found. Now, don't worry, my pet, Mrs. Wetzett said cheerfully. We took care of that before we left. Your mother has had enough to worry her with you and Charles to cope with, and not knowing about your father without our adding to her anxieties. We took a time wrinkle as well as a space wrinkle. It's very easy to do if you just know how. What do you mean? asked Meg. Please, Mrs. Watson, it's all so confusing. Just relax and don't worry over things that needn't trouble you, Mrs. Watson said. We made a nice, tidy little time tester, and unless something goes terribly wrong, we'll have you back about five minutes before you left. So there will be time to spare, and nobody will ever need to know you were gone at all. Though, of course, you'll be telling your mother, dear lamb, that she is. And if something goes terribly wrong, it won't matter because whether we ever got back at all. And if something goes terribly wrong, it won't matter whether we ever get back at all. Don't frighten them, Mrs. Witch's voice came. Are you losing faith? Oh, no, no, I'm not. But Meg thought her voice sounded a little faint. I hope this is a nice planet, Calvin said. We can't see much of it. Does it ever clear up? 
Meg looked around her, realizing that she had been so breathless from the journey and the stop on the two-dimensional planet that she had not noticed her surroundings. And perhaps this was not very surprising, for the main thing about the surroundings was exactly that they were unnoticeable. They seemed to be standing on some kind of nondescript and flat surface, and the air around them was gray. It was not exactly fog, but she could see nothing through it. Visibility was limited to the nicely definite bodies of Charles Wallace and Calvin, the rather unbelievable bodies of Mrs. Watson and the two, and a faint occasional glimmer that was Mrs. Brooks. Come, children, Mrs. Watson said. We don't have far to go. We might as well walk. It will do you good to stretch your legs a little. As they moved through the grayness, Meg caught an occasional glimpse of slag-like rock. But there were no traces of trees or bushes, nothing but flat ground under their feet, no sign of any vegetation at all. Finally, ahead of them, there loomed what seemed to be a hill of stone. As they approached it, Meg could see that there was an entrance that led into a deep, dark cavern. Are we going in there? she asked nervously. Don't be afraid, Mrs. Watson said. It's easier for the happy medium to work with it. Oh, you'll like her, children. She's very jolly. If ever I saw her looking unhappy, I would be very depressed myself. As long as she can laugh, I'm sure everything is going to come out right in the end. Mrs. Watson, what's it? came Mrs. Witch's voice severely. Just because we were very young is no excuse for talking too much. Mrs. Watson looked hurt, but she subsided. Just how old are you, Calvin asked her. Well, just a moment, Mrs. Watson murmured and appeared to calculate rapidly upon her fingers. She nodded triumphantly. I'm exactly two billion three hundred and seventy nine million one hundred and fifty two thousand and four hundred and ninety seven years eight months and three days that is according to your calendar of course which even you know isn't very accurate she leaned closer to meg and calvin and whispered it was really a very great honor for me to be chosen for this mission it's just because of my verbalizing and materializing so well you know but of course we can't take any credit for our talent it's how we use them that counts, and I make far too many mistakes. That's why Mrs. Who and I enjoyed seeing Mrs. Witch make a mistake when she tried to land you on a two-dimensional planet. It was that we were laughing at, not at you. She was laughing at herself, you see. She's really terribly nice to us younger ones. Meg was listening with such interest to what Mrs. Wesley was saying that she hardly noticed when they went into the cave. The transition from the grayness of outside to the grayness of inside was almost unnoticeable. She saw a flickering light ahead of them, ahead and down, and it was toward this that they went. As they drew closer, she realized that it was a fire. It gets very cold in here, Mrs. Watson said, so we asked her to have a good bonfire going for as they approached the fire, they could see a dark shadow against it, and as they went closer still, they could see that the shadow was a woman. She wore a turban of beautiful pale mauve silk and a long flowing purple satin cloth. In her hands was a crystal ball into which she was gazing raptly. She not, did not appear to see the children, Mrs. Wesset, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Witch, but continued to stare into the crystal ball, and as she stared, she began to laugh. She laughed and laughed at whatever it was that she had seen. Mrs. Witch's voice rang out clear and strong, echoing against the walls of the cavern, and the words fell without a sonorous clang. We're here! The woman looked up from the ball, and when she saw them, she got up and curtsied deeply. Mrs. Wetsit and Mrs. Who dropped some curtsies in return, and the shimmer seemed to bet bow slightly. Oh, medium dear, Mrs. Wetsit said, these are the children. Charles Wallace Murray, Charles Wallace bowed, Margaret Murray. Meg felt that if Mrs. Wetsit and Mrs. Who had curtsied, she ought to also. She did, rather awkwardly. And Calvin O'Keefe, and Calvin bobbed his head. We want them to see their home planet, Mrs. Wetsit said. 
The medium lost the delighted smile she had worn till then. Oh, why must you make me look at unpleasant things when there's so many delightful ones to see? Again, Mrs. Witch's voice reverberated through the cave. There will no longer be so many pleasant things to look at if responsible people do not do something about the unpleasant one, 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 one. The medium sighed and held the ball high. Look, children, Mrs. Watson said, look into it well. Que la terre est petite à qui la bois dessus, de l'île. How small is the earth to him who looks from heaven, Mrs. Hu intoned musically. Meg looked into the crystal ball at first with caution, then with increasing eagerness, as she seemed to see an enormous sweep of dark and empty space, and then galaxies swinging across it. Finally, they seemed to move in closer on one of the galaxies. Your own Milky Way, Mrs. Wetsit whispered to Meg. They were headed directly toward the center of the galaxy, and then they moved off to one side. <coughs> Stars seemed to be rushing at them. Meg flung her arm up over her face as though to ward off the glow. Ooh. Mrs. Witch commanded. Meg dropped her arm. They seemed to be moving in toward a planet. She saw that she could make out polar ice caps, and everything seemed sparkling clear. No, no, medium dear, that's Mars, Mrs. Wetsit reproved gently. Do I have to, the medium asked. Now, Mrs. Witch commanded. The bright planet moved out of their vision. For a moment there was a darkness of space and then another planet. The islands of this planet were not clean and clear. It seemed to be covered with a smoky haze. Through the haze, Meg thought she could make out the familiar outlines of the continent like pictures from social studies books. Is it because of our atmosphere that we can't see properly, she asked anxiously. No, Meg, you know that it is not the atmosphere, Mrs. Witch said. You must be brave. It's a thing, Charles Wallace cried. It's a dark thing we saw from the mountain peak on Uriel when we were riding on Mrs. Wetsit's back. Did it just come, Meg asked in agony. Unable to take her eyes from the sickness of the shadow which darkened the beauty of the earth. Did it just come while we've been gone? Mrs. Witch's voice, Witch's voice seemed very tired. How hurt, she said to Mrs. Wetsit. Mrs. Wetsit sighed. No, Meg, it hasn't just come. It has been there for a great many years. That is why your plan is such a troubled one. But why, Calvin started to ask, his voice croaking hoarsely. Mrs. Wetsit raised her hand to silence him. We showed you the dark thing on Uriel first, oh, for many reasons. First, because the atmosphere on the mountain peaks there is so clear and thin you could see it for what it is. And we thought it would be easier for you to understand if, if, if you saw it. Well, someplace else first, not your own earth. I hate it, Charles Wallace cried passionately. I hate the dark thing. Mrs. Wetsit nodded. Yes, Charles, dear, we all do. That's another reason we wanted to prepare you on Uriel. We thought it would be too frightening for you to see it, first of all, about your own beloved world. But what is it, Calvin demanded. We know that it's evil, but what is it? You have said it, Mrs. Witch's voice rang out. It is evil. It is the powers of dark. But what's going to happen? Meg's voice trembled. Oh, please, Mrs. Witch, tell us what's going to happen. We will continue to fight. Something in Mrs. Witch's voice made all three of the children stand straighter, throwing back their shoulders with determination and looking at the glimmer that was Mrs. Witch with pride and confidence. And we're not alone, you know, children, came Mrs. Wetsit, the comforter. All through the universe, it's being fought, all through the cosmos, and my, but it's a grand and exciting battle. I know it's hard for you to understand about size, how there's very little difference in the size of the tiniest microbe in the greatest galaxy. You think about that, and maybe it won't seem strange to you that some of our very best fighters have come right from your own planet. 
And it's a little planet here, out on the edge of a little galaxy. We can be proud that it's done so well. Who have our father's fighters been, Calvin asked. Oh, you must know them, dear, Mrs. Winston said. Mrs. Sue's spectacles shone out at them triumphantly. And the light shined from darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus, Charles Wilde said. Why, of course, Jesus. Of course, Mrs. Wesley said. Go on, Charles, love. There were others, all your great artists, David and lights for us to see by. Leonardo da Vinci, Calvin suggested tentatively, and Michelangelo. And Shakespeare, Charles Wallace called out, and Bach, and Pasteur, and Madame Curie, and Einstein. Now Calvin's voice rang with confidence. And Schweitzer, and Gandhi, and Buddha, and Beethoven, and Rembrandt, and St. Francis. Now you, Meg, Mrs. Watts had ordered. Oh, you flit, I suppose. Meg was in such an agony of impatience that her voice grated irritably. And Copernicus. But what about Father? Please, what about Father? We are going to your Father, Mrs. Watson said. Mrs. Witch said. But where is he? Meg went over to Mrs. Witch and stomped as though she were young as Charles Wallace. Mrs. Wesson answered in a, in a voice that was low but quite firm, On a planet that has given your name. So you must prepare to be very small. All traces of cheer had left the happy medium's face. She sat holding the great ball, looking down for shadowed earth, and a slow tear coursed down her cheek. I can't stand it any longer, she sobbed. Watch now, children, watch. Okay, that is all for chapter five. So in that chapter, we learned a lot of things. We learned about five different dimensions, that the first dimension is like a straight line, the second dimension is like a flat square, the third dimension is like a box, the fourth dimension is sort of like time, and the fifth dimension is sort of like space. And so the way that Mrs. Witch and Mrs. Who and Mrs. What's It travel is by traveling in the fifth dimension and allows them to zip through time and zip through space really fast. So that's what they just did. And then at the end of the chapter, all of the children, through the medium, looked at their world, our world, and saw that a black thing hovered around. And that's all for chapter five. We'll see you next time.